with God this day, whether you're with us in person or watching online. Glad to have you with us and pray we may truly experience God's presence as we gather this day. Flowers on the altar are given to the glory of God by Susan Stecker in celebration of Stacy and Matt's wedding anniversary. Uh, continue to offer our prayers for Mary Lou Peel. I think that she is, sounds like she's going to be going home this week from Windmill Manor. Also, Mary has lifted up prayers for a pastor, one of Mary's friends, and then also sympathy to my wife, death of her brother-in-law, which means I'll be leading a funeral service in Nebraska tomorrow. Also, sympathy to Mary. Uh, she mentioned last week a death of a childhood's her best friend father, and this week, mother, Francine, died. So certainly keep all those people in your prayers. Big thank you to Kevin Heckman, Todd Johnson, Roger Beanhoff, David Scalaru for clearing out trees, and Judy Heckman for some weeding. Indeed, I'm grateful for lots of people who've been doing lots of things this summer and helping me out and making it easy for me to be able to serve you here at Christ the King. So glad to be with you. Let us begin our worship with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. On Mount Horeb, where God had appeared to Moses with typical signs of God's presence, earthquake, wind, and fire, Elijah now experienced God in sheer silence. God assured Elijah that he is not the only faithful believer. 7,000 Israelites are still loyal. God instructed Elijah to anoint two men as kings, 
and to anoint Elisha as his own successor. Our first reading is from 1 Kings chapter 19. A reading from 1 Kings. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking to my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, Return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aaron. And you shall also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Our psalm for today is Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13, which we will read responsively. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall abound from the earth. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord, and shall A right relationship with God is not something we achieve by heroic efforts. It is a gift received in the proclamation whose content is Jesus Christ. This proclaimed word creates our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hence, Christian's proclamation is an indispensable component of God's saving actions. Our second reading is from Romans 10. <coughs> Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how
how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. According to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead on the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain to himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. <laughs> So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. May be seated. Would invite our young people to come forward, but of course we don't have young people uh, this morning. So uh, I was thinking about having a contest for them. So I guess I'll have to ask all of you that are here this morning to be a part of that contest. And what I want you to do is to take off your shoes, maybe socks, and come and line up up here. <laughs> Nobody's doing that. I don't understand. What I want is to see who has the most beautiful feet. <laughs> most of us would say, we, our feet aren't beautiful, no. <laughs> It'd be interesting, because I, I wish our young people were here. It'd be interesting to hear what they have to say. And adults, we say our feet aren't beautiful. Maybe the kids would, would say that. Of course, the reason I say that is because you heard the ending of that reading from Romans, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the good news. And actually, that's a quote from Isaiah. And, and I think the emphasis is not so much on beautiful feet, but a beautiful message. And you think back to the time of Isaiah or Jesus. How did they get that message out? Well, they walked. <laughs> They didn't get in their car and drive like I did to come to Christ the King this morning. They walked wherever they went to be able to go and proclaim that good news. And so their feet were very important in getting around and sharing that good news. And so that Paul lifts that up and it was in Isaiah. How beautiful that, you know, we use our feet to go and proclaim that good news. And so I was thinking about our young people and thinking about ways that you know, it's a little different with this virus now, but they're playing together, maybe at times, you know, needing to offer some forgiveness or some caring or, or you know, before inviting maybe somebody to come to Sunday school with them or, or different ways that, you know, we reach out with God's love. And so, indeed, really, truly, all of you have beautiful feet. You may not know it. <laughs> but you have it as you share God's beautiful message with those around you. So let us pray, and you can repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God thank you, thank you for, beautiful for beautiful feet, for a beautiful message, a beautiful message of, your love for us. of your love for us. Help us to share that message always. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What an interesting 
uh, message this morning. And a couple of things caught my eye as I read this story. Peter is walking on the water, but then he notices those strong winds, and he begins to sink as he is frightened, and he cries out, Lord, save me. And what does Matthew tell us immediately? You know, Jesus reaches out and grabs Peter, and he holds on to him. He caught him. I believe a couple of very important things that happen here in this story. Because I think when Peter starts sinking, overcome with fear, it would be easy to just sink, <laughs> you know, to not do anything, because fear can paralyze us. When we're overwhelmed by our fears, whether they be about our health or job losses or loss of loved ones or uh, what are we going to do with Sunday school and uh, or going, children going to school or all the different things that our virus pandemic has caused us, one reaction can be to be paralyzed by fear, unable to do anything. Peter could have just sunk under the water. But that's not what we here in this story. Peter felt the fear, he, he began to sink, but that at the same time, he called out to the one who could help him, Lord, save me. He didn't let his fears overwhelm him or paralyze him. Instead, he looked to what could be possible in that situation. Looked to the one who could do something to help him. This is so important in times of fear, that we do not let ourselves be so overwhelmed that we don't do anything. Because you know, not doing anything can be a real temptation sometimes in those times of fear, but instead we are to look for possibilities, to live in hope, and most of all, to look to our Lord and Savior, who is with us in all the circumstances of life, certainly with us in those fearful times. Now, <laughs> it does take Trust, you know, faith, to believe in those fearful times that Jesus is with us, that Jesus will walk with us. Because studies have shown that when life hits us hard, we can become so hopeless that we respond by simply giving up. Peter could have done that. I mean, out on the middle of the Sea of Galilee with the waves crashing around him, uh, the wind tearing at his clothing and his beginning to sink, Peter could have thought, I guess it's over for me. There's nothing that can be done. But no, not Peter. Peter does what he can. He lives with some hope and he cries out to the Lord, Lord, save me. That's so important when the waves are seemingly crashing over us to be able to live in that hope that our Lord is with us and to believe not only that our Lord is with us, but that our Lord often comes to us, comes to us through other people to help us weather the storm. We may come out of that storm, you know, battered and bruised because the storms of life often do that to us, but the promise of our Lord is to be with us. And I thought about our, our Christian Education Committee right now. How, how do you plan for this fall? You know, what's going to happen? And, and it would be easy, I think, to become almost hopeless and, and not do anything, but our committee was talking about different possibilities. Maybe Sunday school could be done uh, outside. Maybe there are materials designed, you know, to be used at home. And while we're, you know, used to having children come and, and, and learn from some people willing to teach, maybe, just maybe, if families shared together and parents shared this faith with their children, eh, such sharing might have an amazing effect on our young people's faith. I don't know that, but it's important we stop and think about what the possibilities that our Lord can help us to see. Because one thing I see in this story is how you know, Jesus reaches out to Peter, grabs him, pulls him up out of that raging storm. Yeah, doesn't condemn Peter for not trusting. Jesus doesn't abandon Peter. Jesus is right there. It may be hard for us to realize in the midst of the storms of life that Jesus is there reaching out to us, seeking to help us in the midst of the storm. Actually, one of the reasons that we gather here for worship or listen in on the TV or computer, one of the reasons is to be reminded that Jesus is with us. In our second reading from Romans, Paul asks, you know, how are we to call on those on, on Jesus? How are believers to know 
And his answer is that that faith comes by hearing this promise of God. And we hear those promises in worship. We hear the promises of God being with us in the, in the hymns we sing. We hear the promises in the scripture read or in the liturgy or in the words of Holy Communion that we'll share later, given and shed for you. And hopefully you hear that message in the words of the sermon. We come here to be reminded of this great promise that our Lord does not abandon us, but is with us through all the storms in life, and not only with us, but our Lord is reaching out to us, seeking to pull us up out of our fears. And so I thought, you know, one thing's such a dramatic story, maybe it'd be fun to do a little, you know, visualization with you this morning. We could visualize ourselves in the boat and feel the boat rocking and the, and the waves and all of that. And then maybe see Jesus coming, walking toward us. That should make you afraid like it made the disciples. And then, you know, hearing Jesus say, you know, it is I, don't, don't be afraid. And then can you, can you picture yourself as Peter, you know, asking Jesus to invite you to come walk on water? Can you see yourself doing that? And then you start walking on the water, but then you notice the waves and the wind, and you begin to sink, and you feel yourself sinking, and yet crying out, Lord, save me. And at that point in the visualization, I, visualization, I was thinking what I would do then was to have you reach out to someone and grab them, <laughs> hold on to them, just as we heard in the story of Jesus reaching out and grabbing Peter. But obviously, with our being spread around, <laughs> the virus, uh, we can't do that so much, but can you feel Jesus, you know, reaching out, grabbing you, holding on to you, his grip saving you? Because I love that image, for truly our Lord does walk with us in this life, and there are those times when fears beset us, and Jesus reaches out, reaches out to us, often through other people, to bring us hope, to help us overcome our fears. Because as I was thinking about that visualization and this reaching out to one another, that's, that's kind of one of the things that this virus pandemic has taken away from us. Because I've watched some of you coming together and, and wanting to reach out, <laughs> maybe a touch, maybe a hug, and conveying that message of caring and loving. And yet in this time, you have felt like you can't do that. And I've seen that otherwise, though, in other times when uh, someone feels overwhelmed and another person reaches out to them, holds them, and in some way, in some sense, they are, you know, they're saved. <laughs> they are rescued. And that's a picture of Jesus, you know, reaching out to us, holding us, pulling us up out of the waters, out of our fears as we sing. I think of a time in my ministry when I was feeling inadequate, overcome, fearful, serving a congregation that had learned how to fight with one another, <laughs> members wanting to be in control, a stressful time. In fact, I told my wife if I didn't get out of there, I was going to have a heart attack. And as an aside, the pastor that followed me after two years had a heart attack and died. <laughs> And in my situation, though, God reached out to me and called me to another congregation, a congregation that, that reached out to me, loved me, and I didn't sink down into the waters. As I look back on my life, I can see many times when fears were there, when fears kept me from moving forward, but that somehow God reached out, reached out through others and lifted me up, kept me from sinking into the waters. Many times such situations are not so, you know, dramatic because after all, most of us are not going to be walking on water and need Jesus to pull us up out of the water as we're sinking. In fact, I think because our gospel story is such a dramatic story with Peter walking on the water that it could be easy to turn this into, you know, kind of a challenge or encouragement for you to do some dramatic leap in faith something like walking on water, but I see here just as much an emphasis that Jesus is with us. And in many ways, I think this is really a picture of everyday faith. It's not faith in our abilities as Christians that if I just, you know, believed enough, somehow I could walk on water. 
No, it's a story of how Jesus is always with us, who continues to rescue us despite our fears and our failings. In fact, in many ways, I see Jesus reaching out as I observe you on a Sunday morning when you stop and show someone you care, especially when you know a person is hurting and maybe needs some rescuing. I see it in a smile given that can lift up someone in this time of isolation. I see Jesus reaching out in, in phone calls made or prayers shared that in so many ways not so dramatic, not dramatic like pulling somebody out of the raging waters, but still in ways that show the love of our God reaching out to us, maybe to help us pull us up out of some depression, because again, we keep hearing over and over and read how many people in this time of virus pandemic are feeling low levels of depression. And if we can be that person who helps by reaching out, by seeking to lift up another, we can show that that love of God reaches out to one another. Because truly, in the living of our lives, we will fail at times, and we will fall short of all that we want to do or be, we may we'll feel that we are sinking at times. But remember, Jesus is always there. And I want to comment on these words from Jesus that when he grabs hold of Peter and he says, you have little faith, why did you doubt? I, I suppose they could be said in a condemning way, Jesus condemning Peter for not having enough faith to keep walking on the water. But I don't really see it that way. I don't think Jesus really expected Peter or us to walk on water. Instead, it's almost like a, a lament from Jesus. Jesus really wanting to have Peter have this faith, trusting Jesus. And so I hear Jesus really trying to encourage Peter at that moment. You can trust me, Peter, Jesus is saying. Rather than Jesus hitting us over the head with condemnation when we fail or when our fears overwhelm us, I hear Jesus encouraging us, encouraging us to continue on as we face each difficulty in life. Because Jesus is there and wants us to trust him, always saying to us, I am here. Why do you doubt? Keep trusting me. I will hold fast to you. Just as I held Peter, I will hold you. And so I see this story of, of, of Jesus saving Peter as a story that's being told over and over again in our lives, telling this story of how God comes to rescue us again and again. Indeed, as we come here this morning to receive this meal of Holy Communion, a meal saying we are in need of rescuing, loving, forgiving. Jesus is saying, I have done it. I have rescued you. Trust me. Amen. And so we sing about going through the tempestuous sea, unknown waves, always asking Jesus to pilot us, lead us, saying to us, as he said to his disciples, take heart, it is I do not be afraid. Jesus, Savior, pilot me.
rescues us using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and help by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the Church, the world, and all who are in need. O oh God, our Savior, give us courage in the midst of the storms of life. Help us to see and hear Jesus calling. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. May we follow our Lord wherever he leads. Hear us, O oh God. O oh God, you have gathered us here today as your people, and we thank you for this gift of life. We pray for students and teachers preparing for a new school year and for those struggling with unexpected hardship. Supply us generously with your grace for our life together. Hear us, O oh God. God of the earth, may we care for your wonderful creation. Be with those who have suffered because of recent storms and bring rain for those areas hit by drought. Hear us, O oh God. O oh God, sovereign of the world, inspire those who govern to keep peace with their neighbors and to maintain justice for their citizens. Calm the world's violence, strengthen the world's democracies, and may our leaders strive for equity, equality for all. Hear us, O oh God. Compassionate God, you promise that everyone who calls upon your name will be saved. Be with all who are lonely, hear the voices of those who cry out in anguish, and support those who are frustrated in their search for an affordable place to live. We pray for those suffering this day, especially Mary Lou and others we name in our hearts before you. Hear us, O oh God. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the saints of the whole church from all times and places, and for the saints in our lives and in our community whom you have gathered to yourself. Comfort all who mourn this day. Gather us with them on the day of salvation. Hear us, O oh God. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Fulfilling the promise of the resurrection, you pour out the fire of your Spirit, uniting in one body people of every nation and tongue. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
receive strength and then preserve you unto life eternal. Christ is with you. 